It's Cyber Monday, when cyber civilians go shopping and cyber villains go hacking. So if you forgot Patch Tuesday, then with GDPR's 72-hour requirement, we can expect Breach Notification Thursday, followed by Password Reset Friday, We Take Security Seriously Saturday, Class Action Sunday. Uh, no one knows what happened to Wednesday, which means this week we talk with Chris Weisopol from Veracode about the systemic risk in software development and the tools and practices that can help teams fix flaws faster. In the news segment, bug bounty payout practices, exploit scenarios for WebKit's CSP reporting, securing Edge's super duper mode, firmware flaws in Android devices, poking at processors on the switch, and more. Bring us, buy some cybers and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. Looking to improve your web application security? Probly is reinventing web application security. Probly focuses on the vulnerabilities that matter, eliminates false positives with evidence-based scanning, and provides a simple point-and-shoot solution that is easy to use. Probly's thorough coverage ensures accurate identification of vulnerabilities in any modern web application or API. Improve your web application security processes by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Probly and start your free trial today. Software supply chain attacks are continuing to expose vulnerabilities in organizations around the world. The time has come to focus your efforts on security for your software packages. CloudSmith is the only cloud-native software package management solution for your enterprise. With CloudSmith continuous packaging, you can securely deliver software across the globe and mitigate potential threats from entering your supply chain. With over 23 plus formats supported, CloudSmith is the solution that engineers choose to safely deliver all of their assets. Reduce unneeded downtime and deliver with confidence. Start securing your software supply chain today by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash cloudsmith. This is episode 176, recorded November 29th, 2021. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and as always, I'm here with John Kinsella. Hello, John. As always, happy Monday. How are you? Happy Monday, as always. We'll find out what's going to happen with Wednesday. Still don't know. Um, what I do know is that in an overabundance of caution, we have decided to flip this year's Security Weekly Unlocked to a virtual format. The safety of our listeners and hosts is our number one priority. We will miss seeing you all in person, but we hope you can still join us at Security Weekly Unlocked Virtual. This event will now take place on Thursday, December 16th from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. You can still register for free at securityweekly.com slash unlocked. Chris Weisopol is CTO and co-founder of Veracode. He oversees technology strategy and information security. Prior to joining Veracode in 2006, Chris was vice president of research and development at security consultancy at stake, which was acquired by Symantec. In the 1990s, Chris was one of the original vulnerability researchers at The Loft, a hacker think tank, where he was one of the first to publicize the risks of insecure software. He has testified to the U.S. Congress on the subjects of government security and how vulnerabilities are discovered in software. Hello, Chris. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me on, on your show. Um, you know, I think I figured out what, what happens on Wednesday. <laughs> Please share. Uh, so after, cause it's, cause it's uh patch Tuesday, of course it's exploit Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I think you called it exactly. Um, which is good because, um, you know, with the history of sitting in front of Congress describing how these, uh, exploits are discovered and, and, and used, um, we appreciate you coming here. Um, hopefully you don't need a lawyer to hang out and talk to us. So, so that's a good sign. I think we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, speaking of the 90s and perhaps Exploit Wednesday, um, you know, there's some systemic risk out there in software. I think um, I'm trying not to start us off on a completely pessimistic note, just saying maybe nothing has changed in the last 30 years. Software still has flaws. Software still has vulnerabilities. But, um, you know, th there's still some systemic risks in software, closed source as well as open source. But maybe we're learning a, either a bit better about where how those how those vulnerabilities come in or maybe we're learning better how to find them and hopefully we're getting better at fixing them but um rather than just hoping on these things maybe help us out a bit with uh, that finding and fixing life cycle you know what what are we doing better on either one of those angles 
Yeah. So, you know, there's always been systemic risk because we've always had shared technology we used, right? Whether it was, you know, the domain name system or the routing system or the operating systems we used, like that systemic risk has always been with us, but I think we always kind of identified it as that. Um, the, the new systemic risk that I see is really the open source ecosystem because we have a lot of shared code that we use and we don't often think about it as shared shared risk. You know, there's a, there's a region that, you know, there's Patch Tuesday, right? So everyone gets the information at the same time so everyone can patch at the same time. Um, the challenge with, you know, open source vulnerabilities is uh, p- people have a hard time understanding all the open source that they're using, what vulnerabilities are in those open source packages, if it affects them. So it's it's a much more challenging problem to do the fixing part for that kind of uh, systemic risk than for things that are very clear. You know, you're you're running, you know, Windows 10 or you know, Windows, which version of Windows Server you're using or which version of Linux. Um, and that's where open source becomes much more of a challenge to for organizations to keep up to date and you know keep all that stuff patched. Yeah, and I think I was taking a peek at, at, at Vericode's state of software security, and one of the things that really leaped out to me is just how much open source is in all of the applications we use. And I don't necessarily mean that as I'm surprised by it because there's a lot of good utilities built in open source. But the, certain languages seem to lean more towards just using open source, and suddenly you have a very big responsibility now to pay attention to things like software composition analysis before you even get into running other linters or other analysis tools on your own software. So, you know, if we see that there's so much, you know, open source packages out there that we know are vulnerable, it's it's great that we have that observability. But how do we pull in that other side of the coin? mixing metaphors here, not sure where I'm going, uh, but just actually getting it fixed. So it's one thing to know we've got a problem. It's no, we've got Patch Tuesday, but now we've actually got to do something about it before these exploits come in. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we we, we studied um, for our uh, state of software security um, report last year um, that uh, we, we wanted to understand, you know, why aren't people fixing things faster? <laughs> Right? Why? Why does it take some people hours or days to update a piece of open source software where they know there's a vulnerability in it? Right? They've done their scanning. Um, the tools have told them where that is. You know, it's it's accurate. They know it's there. Why does it take some people hours or maybe days? And and some organizations, it takes many many weeks or even months, um, maybe even half a year. To, to, to fix issues. And uh, there's a lot of different reasons why this happens. And these are just all organizational challenges that a development team has. So the fixing part, there's not a lot of security expertise, you know, you need. It's just, it's just identified, mm-hmm. identify the, the library that needs to be updated. Um, but the challenge is all in the mechanics of, of doing this. The way organizations use open source is, this kind of set it and forget it mindset. Like once the package is selected, um, it just it's just going to sit there for pretty much forever. That's sort of the design. Like I've I've incorporated some code and I'm just going to use it for the lifetime of the application. And only if you know some great new feature comes out and it happens to be in the same uh, same library I'm using, will I update that? And so that's sort of the starting point. The other the other thing to remember is. You know, if you've joined a team, a uh, development team, a couple years after this application has been written, you probably don't want to start changing things that happened before your time and just start, you know, <laughs> pulling out libraries. So there's this real inertia to to not change anything <laughs> once it's been incorporated in the code, unless you absolutely have to. And 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 a, and a security issue which seems kind of theoretical doesn't seem like it'll have a lot of impact just gets on the bottom of the priority list 
Now multiply this times 100 for each application because there's a, probably 100 packages and dozens of them have vulnerabilities in them. And over a few years, you have every application that is in your organization is vulnerable to this when it you, vulnerable to a uh, an issue that's coming in through the open source usage. And, uh, you know, people just have to change the way they think about um, keeping these things updated. Just the way IT people know, they kind of have to patch all the Windows machines every month. Like that's part of running Windows is patching it every month. <laughs> part of running open source is going to be maybe even quicker than a monthly cadence thinking about what I need to update. So, so I'm curious then, do we see or do you see a difference then between we have all these vulnerabilities, they've all got to be fixed, but maybe a lot of them don't have to be because they're not as consequential. The the exploit scenarios are really few and far between, or th there's other mitigating controls that honestly would take probably just as much time to figure out as it would to patch them. So you're kind of shifting maybe, well, I don't know if you're doing this, but could we be shifting the communication around fixing vulns from just these are all security vulns, security vulns, security vulns, fix all these security vulns, and we're you know we're not going to have them necessarily prioritize. Just say, keep your stuff up to date. Here are some practices. You know, I guess is, is there something successful there because you're talking about companies that are taking days and months to fix flaws. So is, is that necessarily always a bad thing, or how can we put this into maybe a different perception or perspective? Well, if you if you take the point of view that um, updating this stuff is hard and it takes a lot of resources mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of specialized knowledge and you're coming at it from that point of view, then you're going to say, well, I really need to diagnose this problem. You're going to spend a lot of time diagnosing whether you really need to update this library. What's the true risk? And you're going to have to take into account the environment, the data that that code has access to, what's the exploitability, what's the likelihood, what's um, you know what, what's happening out in the wild? Is there something out there? So you can take that point of view of really doing a deep diagnosis of whether something really needs to be updated or not and spend a lot of time doing that. Or on the other hand, you can build your your application development pipeline such that um, it it's really easy to uh, to do a pull request and update something to a new version and have the automated testing in place where you can be confident that um, you're not breaking anything by doing this update. And you can try to just use automation to keep everything up to date. Those are two different approaches. And sometimes one approach works better than the other. But I think in modern development, where people mm -hmm. are working towards highly automated pipelines, um, having sufficient testing and testing coverage and load testing and A-B testing and things like this, so that they can push out code in a very continuous method, um, con you know, continuous deployment. Then, then maybe you just want to lean on. Let's just keep everything up to date. And and to to my point of view, modern software development um, that works better. If you're in an environment where you're working off this, you know, twenty year old code base that is, you know, no one no one is at the organization anymore that wrote any of the code. And you're just trying to keep it up to date. I mean, you're just trying to keep it secure. Um, then maybe you want to take the other approach of really determining: Do I really need to update this? So modern software development really says just keep everything up to date, as as you were saying. So that that's a good split between this legacy, but versus doing things the modern way. Along the lines of doing modern development, are there good? You know, that that sounds like good ways of just aligning goals, aligning incentives to say we're just used to patching because we have confidence, like you were saying that things won't go wrong. So have you seen, or where have you seen successful organizations find incentives that drive those desirable behaviors or have metrics that are that are actually measuring and me measuring things that that don't create those perverse incentives that just say, well, we're, we're, we're working towards this particular number, but we're not actually fixing code or patching any better or things like that. So how do we do this in a healthy way to get that those goals aligned? Well, it's it, it's interesting. So, like you know, a lot of the the um, the attributes of 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 DevOps 
are all around, you know, reliability and velocity of, of, of change, right? So you can, you can, you can change a lot of code really quickly and still have a lot of reliability. So you can do, you know, m- multiple deplo- de- deployments a day um, and uh, things are scalable and things are resilient, things are robust you know, that fits in. To, so organizations that have those goals and, and are trying to do that just for, for functional, reliable code, those are the kinds of organizations that we find can update their libraries in those hour time frames, frames because the organization's metrics, are they're already working towards, you know, changing a library shouldn't affect us very much because we're, we're used to that high rate of change and high and and also still have high reliability. So uh, I, I think that you know, one of the things we found was the more modern the development practices are, the more teams embrace DevOps, the more security sort of comes along for free because you're allow you're able to stay up to date, you're able to fix things quickly. Um, you're able if anyone makes a mistake while they're fixing something, you're able to diagnose it. And 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 make a new fix rather quickly. So the the organization doesn't have a fear that something's going to go wrong just because they're fixing vulnerabilities. So one question on that though. So it, what I've seen over the last few years, Chris, is um, often we can update that library and everything runs just as you said. Like you, you know, check it in, go through your CI, everything's fine. But with some of the languages, I'm thinking about Go. I think JavaScript a little bit too. Um, but the design of that, the the sort of general consensus of the people developing those libraries is it's on the develop it's on the consumer of that library to um, uh, update their code as time goes on. In other words, there's not so much uh, um, of a contract around um, the API API itself. So I might see there's a security vulnerability in you know uh, say. Uh, um, GitHub's Pentabot tells me there's a vulnerability in some Go library. So I go ahead and I update it. Um, I run my unit test, everything seems fine. I check that code, and you're going to say my unit tests aren't good enough. But I check my code, and I go and release that into prod, and the next thing I know, something's broken. Um, so I'm curious, what what do you, what's your thoughts or what's on your head, you know, in your head around not just you know bumping a version, but the chance that that version bump might actually cause um, other things that weren't quite so expected. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think you know we're probably simplifying a little bit for the discussion, yeah. but yeah, a lot of yeah. things can go wrong. I mean, one of the things that you find in some of these languages like like Go and and and, and JavaScript, especially, is that um, libraries have dependencies upon dependencies, right? Mm-hmm. So you end up when you go to update something, you're updating something that you're updating a library that your li- your library is dependent on, and that's dependent on something else. And then sometimes you get stuck in a situation where um, in order to update, to fix one problem, you're updating to a library, which now has a vulnerability that hasn't been fixed yep. yet. So, you know, it, 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 you get this nested problem of complexity. Um, the more, the more, the more dense, densely and um, nested these different um, libraries uh, use each other. These different packages use each other, and so yeah, it you you would hope it would be simple, um, but but sometimes you just can't get the test coverage, uh, and and I think you know in that case you just have to have the resiliency to be able to you know to be able to roll to detect things in production to be able to be able to roll back, but you're mm-hmm. not gonna you're not gonna discover that until you try to do. The update, of course. the The other thing you could do is you could just, you know, run with the risk. Um, in, in 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 you know that that vulnerability, you know, isn't going to really affect you, or no one's gonna no one's gonna try to exploit that vulnerability. Um, but the problem with that approach is it just adds up over time, mm-hmm. and then you know at some point you 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 will you will get exploited. I mean, the other thing that, to think about is the threat space is changing, so that. Uh, you know, attackers are not going after targeted attacks as much. They're going after more, more, more opportunities. So they're really looking at vulnerabilities from a point of, I know of a vulnerability. I know how to detect it in someone else's mm-hmm. infrastructure. I know how to exploit it. And let's go wide across the internet trying to do that. 
Um, that approach means that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're probably going to be hit eventually. Um, and, and, and so it, it just becomes a matter of time if you're not going to stay up to date. Yeah. The, the, the people who have a target on their back, um, that's a little different problem than the general yeah. people using the application. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to circle back and sort of, um, sum up what you're just saying, because I think you, you said something interesting there. For our listeners, so a lot of our listeners are either you know users or managers or developers or team leads, um, and I think the point I was trying to get to was you put all this time into your CI/CD process, everything's amazing, you can do a rollout in 30 seconds, but you still have, still end up rolling out something into prod, which is as you said got a vulnerability in it. But I think the most important takeaway there for people is don't be afraid to be able to roll back, right? It's it's if right. you you put that beautiful system into place, test it, and you know make sure you have confidence in it, not just not just deploying, but actually going, oh, we need to bounce back, you know, a few days or a few hours. Yeah. And it also gives you that flexibility to have more time to maybe diagnose if you really have to make a change or, you know, you, yeah. because you can push into production with the knowledge that, yes, I know I have my vulnerability there, but I, I wasn't held up trying to make a decision before I could push the new functionality into production. But you're quick. You're 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 really. You can quickly update once you have the new information, or you can quickly you know roll roll, roll back. Um, so that that flexibility is just so powerful um, from from a security standpoint. Even though it's built for other reasons. Yep. <laughs> There's also a wealth of just libraries out there because talking about the idea: should we use this library? Are we stuck with this library? Or like you and John were just saying, you have this really gnarly graph of dependencies. This one update causes this cascade of, oh crap, a whole bunch of others that now we need to fix. And we saw, for example, with Heartbleed several years ago, suddenly everybody was like, eh, maybe OpenSSL isn't the software we want to use. And so we have Boring, Libra, you know, Amazon, Cloudflare, Google, all came out with basically replacements for OpenSSL, uh, which is good, but that is also just one library. So have you seen, or do you think there is an arc where organizations will either start re creating, refactoring particular open source libraries? Or is, is there ever going to be a case where they'll just start saying, maybe we don't need those 15 lines of code for uh, you know how, how to, to indent you know tabs properly? Um, are, are software development practices going to change around the libraries we're consuming? Or is that kind of a, a lost cause at this date? Yeah, there's definitely not been much governance over this at, at at most organizations. It's 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 any developer that needs some functionality can can typically pull down that code um, and uh, and 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 sort of put it into that set it and forget it mode where everyone who works on that project into the future will be inheriting that decision. Um, I, I think those days are are slowly going away as other factors are being brought in. Um, to the to the equation besides just purely functionality, right? It used to just be functionality was how a library got selected. Now um, people are looking at other metrics around an open source project. Um, you know, how often are you know are are do releases come out? How often do bug fix releases come out? Um, what's the uh, what's the vulnerability track record? Um, of of this of this project, um, is it is it a steady stream of vulnerabilities? Was there a big burst of vulnerabilities, you know, a couple of years ago, and it hasn't happened since then, which may mean there there was some sort of audit that happened. I, I should say I should say you know security fixes, not vulnerabilities. But um, looking at that project health is is now a factor that that some organizations are using to select libraries. And even to to deselect libraries, like if if you're on a project that has a you know it's going to be complicated to fix and do this update, um, and the project has poor health, why not move to something else um, at, at at that point in time? So more than functionality is is what's uh, being being thought of uh, these days, um, and I think there's going to be some good you know tools coming in the future to help to help developers make make better choices. Um, ar ar around the parts they use. This is this is goes back to you know quality control in a manufacturing process. Um, a lot of manufacturers um, switched over to using like if we look at auto manufacturers, 
in the 80s, there was this push to switch over to trusted suppliers that could deliver consistent quality rather than just for going for the cheapest, fastest. Um, and that's how you got higher quality manufacturing. I, I think those kind of notions are, are starting to take grip with the usage of open source because it's it code is now being assembled, right? It, there's more parts from different places being assembled than anything else in the software development process. Yeah, and what you're describing too are basically engineering practices out of which, if they're good practices, comes some good security. And you you highlighted that previously in, in this conversation as well. So uh, along those lines, maybe let me ask a different path on that uh, related to that question, the sense of what about attack classes? Now, speaking of the, 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 the car companies, automotive companies in the 80s, um, perhaps, you know, uh, hacking or organizations in the 90s, you've, you've perhaps got a history, a good one, of just seeing vulnerabilities out there. Is there an arc of attack classes or attack types that are going away or can go away? Or you know, what, what about focusing engineering you know, efforts on that type of approach so that we say this particular framework has solved X, Y, or Z problem as opposed to just here is another you know, patch version for a library? Yeah, so I think the the biggest example of that is is just the you know memory corruption issues mm. that plague languages like 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 C C plus plus, um, and you know there are some uh, efforts underway to rewrite you know parts of you know the Linux kernel and Go and things like that, or is it Rust? I guess it's Rust. Yeah. Rust. Um, so so to to use the the more uh, memory managed. Uh, languages. I know Microsoft has rewritten a lot of their critical um, attack surface code, like Exchange is, uh, you know, a, a SMTP code into .NET. So I, I think that there was a kind of a push to do this. You know, it started probably about 10 years ago. People started rewriting critical code in, in, in managed code. Um, but it, it, there's been there's been some of that, but there hasn't there hasn't really been uh, been a lot of a lot of that. Um, I think some of the things that you know whole classes can go away um, due to the way you know um, platforms implement things is 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 really a lot of it is in the crypto um, world. Mm. If if uh, you know things like session sessions and session management has done really been done well by by frameworks. Um, both, you know, uh, .NET and other, 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 other frameworks. Um, so we've seen things like session management problems kind of go away in web applications because people just have good libraries um, to do that. So that's sort of another, you know, cri crypto exam example. Um, I, I think you can do the same thing with classes like cross-site scripting and SQL injection. If people would just you know, but the problem is they have to recode their applications, right? So starting from mm -hmm. scratch, it's okay. But um, yeah. the problem is there's just so much, there's so much code out there. And remember, I, I just talked about, you know, third-party code, we want to set and forget it. You know, no one wants to rewrite all their database queries, right? Or, <laughs> or all their HTML output code. Um, so it's, it's a real challenge. I think the solutions are there. Today, if you're starting from scratch to pick good frameworks and good libraries and good languages, the challenge is, uh, you know, all the code that's already been written. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Well, I guess, well, should we be looking forward to a uh, loft crack? It's just one open source. Will that be rewritten in uh, Rust uh, next year? <laughs> no, I think it's going to stay in uh, C++. C, C++. Um, we, we've been, <laughs> we were lucky enough to not really have uh, many vulnerabilities. Um, we did have a couple Indeed. early on though, um, oh. which, you know, that it's, it's quite a humbling experience when you're writing a security tool to, uh, to, to, to be called out as making your customers vulnerable. Um, maybe I don't, I, I don't know why, you know, other companies don't sort of <laughs> feel like this is so horrible, but as an individual developer, I felt bad about writing a vulnerability and, and not finding it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the whole nature of the, this, the, 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 the game though, right?
It is. Yeah. You know, InfoSec is such a friendly and uh, helpful bunch all the time, aren't they? Oh, dear. Yes, definitely. (laughs) (laughs) So rolling forward, maybe from the the past back towards the the present or even the future, a a lot of your themes were actually, like, like I said before, engineering practices out of which good security comes. So are there some certain things that you would be that you would love to see in terms of a new engineering practices or an organization that let's set aside the legacy aspect because those are hard and possibly intractable at this point. But what's maybe one or two practices or the one or two tools or types of approaches that are the smart things to adopt that sets them on the right path so that, you know, two years from now or even next year on uh, Patch Tuesday, there'll be uh, zero patches for them to to deal with because they've been so diligent about their practices. Yeah, so I think some of it starts with just education. Um, And I'm not sure that most, or I guess I am pretty sure that most computer science curriculums (laughs) don't have any notion of Mm -hmm. a lot of the the different things that engineers learn. Like engineers, you know, uh, I I did when I was in when when I was in engineering school, um, and I was taking a, a structural engineering class, We saw a video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington basically uh, getting getting destroyed by wind Mm -hmm. oscillations um, and how wind oscillations were a problem for any large-scale structure that uh, anyone who's building those had to think about, right? That was something that that you learned in an engineering class. So that was part of, of the mindset. I don't think we learn about uh, you know, security failures as part of computer science, right? So there isn't any notion from the foundational levels of computer science when you're learning it that if I write a program in a certain amount, certain way, um, it's going to fail when an adversary mm-hmm. um, attacks it, right? Like that. That isn't part of what you learn. So I, I think fundamentally, more um, engineering like curriculum has to go into computer science where we think about things like you know reliability in the in the face of an adversary so i think that's kind of a foundational thing because everyone is writing software now that is connected you know to the internet and um, privacy is probably a concern with the data or financial mm-hmm. considerations and so it, it's hard to think of a job these days where you might be de- being a software uh, developer and 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 security and privacy aren't a concern um, with the program you're writing. So it, it just should be, should be foundational. So I think that's a that's a good starting point. Um, but then then I think after that, it really comes down to what we've been talking about is is good software engineering d- disciplines where you can um, you can have non functional requirements um, like like performance and uh, reliability and uh, security and, and have those properly uh, tested for as, as part of your development pipeline and um, be, be requirements uh, of, of delivering the software. And just, just so use all the goodness of your great uh, you know, CI CD pipeline where you're able to continuous deliver code and make sure that all those other non-functional requirements are also continuously delivered and, and standards are, 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 are kept. So um, I guess the, that, that's, th- those are my two, they're, they're sort of big asks. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, this is an easy problem where it's just, mm-hmm. you know, run this tool and then follow the steps that the tool tells you to do. Um, you know, I, I think it's, 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 a more, it's a more challenging problem than, than simply just running the tool. Absolutely. And I think uh, I got squeeze in one last question because I, I love the Tacoma Bridge example because, as you're alluding to in InfoSec, in cybersecurity, uh, you also have somebody unscrewing bolts or taking, you know, yeah. uh, trying messing it with the bridge, let alone the force of nature. Uh, you know, as, as we're starting here off the cuff, building up a, a new computer science curriculum, uh, do you have, you know, w- what would you point to? Do you have some ideas? What would be the Tacoma Narrow Bridges of uh, InfoSec or AppSec? Yeah, so um, de- definitely you want to show examples of, um, you know, sort of the un- un- unintended consequences of, um, you know, a- a- attackers being able to have, you know, sort of full knowledge of 
uh, of your code and and, and access mm-hmm. to your system, um, you know what 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 could what could fail. Um, I, I think this can this can happen is sort of in any at, at any at any level. Um, one one that I'm hearing, you know, quite quite a lot about now is is with machine learning, and the whole adversarial machine learning. And I, I think I think it's a it's a good it's a good continuation on top of, you know, the the challenges of machine learning to begin with. Just take like an autonomous car, and and you already have the challenge of a very you know, diverse visual environment where you can have signs and traffic cones and pedestrians and all these things that you have to recognize, but then throw into that the idea that an attacker can put symbols and objects in the view mm-hmm. that that may maybe can confuse confuse uh, the, the vehicle. And so the the idea is whenever you're designing something new, like uh, you know, using machine learning to drive the car, from the very beginning, start with those you know those adversarial test cases, and start from the very beginning of you know what what would an attacker do? Not just what could go wrong, like in the natural world, like yes, trees fall down, right? Um, cars back out of driveways. Um, and and we always think of those as sort of the natural world, but then like, well, what if someone like cut the tree down in front of your car, or what if someone rolled a car in front of you mm-hmm. on purpose? They're very actually close to what happens in the natural world, but uh, you have to start to think about what if adversaries can manipulate that world. And I, I, I think we always like to think of security as this completely other domain that we don't have to worry about un- until we have to worry about security. And I think it's a more of a gray area than people want to admit. Absolutely. I, I love those examples. And uh, now being worried about trees being cut down and cars being pushed out, I suppose I'm <laughs> glad I'm not your neighbor, <laughs> but uh, I am glad that you joined us here to talk about, uh, you know, risks of software and share uh, quite a bit of your, you know, illustrious history uh, w- within application security. So I just want to say, uh, give a very big thank you, Chris, for joining us. Sure, it's great to be here. Interesting discussion. Thanks for having me. And welcome to come back as we build up that uh, the, the Tacoma Narrows of uh, of AppSec. I think uh, you mentioned Exchange, so Exchange might be one of those examples that goes on that list of uh, things we can learn from. Also want to say thank you to John for joining me. Thank you to all of our listeners. If you'd like to learn more about Veracode, visit securityweekly.com slash Veracode. We're going to take a quick break now and return with news of the week. 